Sit down, step down. Let's hear it from step down. This next part gets a little bit awkward. Uh, we were not planning on this. Uh, our next performer, as it happens, is uh, one of the guests of one of you people, one of the Joko Cruz Crazy guests. Uh, uh, hold your applause. <laughs> Yesterday he came in third place in bingo. And the prize that the cruise ship awarded him that they did not tell us about is that he gets to perform a set in tonight's show. <laughs> we had a, a, a very testy meeting uh, with the management and, and rather than, than fight it, uh, we figured we might as well just get this over with. Um, and on top of everything else, uh, apparently he is only known as number 57. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome number 57. tuxedo, or his wetsuit, or both, <laughs> falls into the corridor I patrol via that air vent we never do anything about. He crushes Barry's windpipe with the side of his hand, and Barry hits the floor and gasps for breath like a fish, and his eyes fill with horror and sadness and resignation. The intruder adjusts his bow tie or a snorkel, and he says, say cat got your tongue, and he chuckles, and I think of Barry's actual cat, a stray he rescued from under an abandoned car and named Chevy, <laughs> and I think of how Chevy will be scratching at the door waiting for Barry to come home, and I raise my machine gun and I cock it, which makes a noise, and the intruder turns around, and he says, I understand you're angry, and he raises his hands, but only sort of halfway to indicate his insincerity about it. And he eyes the hot steam pipes which Dr. Apocalypse installed along the hallways right about eye level. And he turns his wrist just so to better aim his watch band missile launcher, and he says, maybe you need to let off some, and that's when I shoot him! A short burst right into his chest, and another in his belly, and he falls into a puddle of himself, and I walk over, and I stand over him, and I say, Cat got your tongue, you stupid, cliche, spouting son of a bitch! <laughs> and I fire, and I fire, and I wake up all sweaty next to Bev. And she says, the dream again? And I say, yes. And she says, did you get to hit him? And I say, yes, that's how I know it was a dream. <laughs> And she says, good for you, honey, and rolls over and goes back to sleep. It's, um, it's not what you hear about, you know, all the dorks talking down at the comic book shop. They make their jokes and I don't say anything. There's no help wanted ad in the paper or Craigslist. There's no anonymous notice saying wanted, stern, ruthless men willing to do anything, no questions asked. The doctor 
used to do it that way, but you get loose cannons, egotists, guys who thought they should be in charge. No, it's, if it's the kind of work you're good at that you're good for, they'll find you. Then they don't tell you what it is, not at first. They say, we're looking for men who can rise to a challenge, but only when we tell them to. <laughs> they let you figure out what the work is. The first time you pull hostage guarding duty or have to feed the man-eating sharks and you look at what's in the bucket, and you're okay with it, you know. By that time, you've been enjoying the benefits, the hours, the jumpsuits. <laughs> and you don't want to make waves. They know you feel that way. That's the biggest reason they picked you. The first time you meet Dr. Apocalypse, it's because you've screwed up. I think they set you up for that. They tell you, just make sure you bolt down that energy beam projector right to the doctor won't like it. And they shake their heads and they pull their finger across their throat, you know. So you bolt it down as tight as you can until the wrench gives you blisters. But of course, the intruders, when they come, just saw a big circle around it on the floor and it falls down into the cellar where they've got their submarine. And you can hear them laughing and you fire into the hole and they keep laughing. So they bring you to see Dr. Apocalypse and he's just as you imagined with his white lab coat and the goggles that never come off. And he rails at you with his raspy voice and you're thinking, is this the same guy who sends those handwritten personal notes along with your employment evaluation? Who writes those really sweet anecdotes about his early days as a street criminal for the secret base newspaper? It is, though. This is just his other side. So you listen as he rails about your incompetence and your failures, and then he pulls the lever, and you fall into the piranha tank. It doesn't hurt much. It's shocking to hit the water, even if you're ready for it. And the piranhas do nibble a bit, but pretty soon, they open the tank and take you out and hand you a towel and a fresh jumpsuit. And you're instructed to keep away from Dr. Apocalypse for a while. And if you do see him, answer to another name. <laughs> Sometimes I, I wonder if Dr. Apocalypse knows he's being fooled by his number one, you know, because actually feeding the employees the meat-eating fish would be murder and morale and employment retention, even in this economy. But I think the doctor really believes it. The really nice note he sent on my fourth anniversary of the secret base was addressed to somebody with a different name. Although it did mention Bev and the kids. Weird. <laughs> if you really want to know, the hard thing about the job is not being punished for failure. It's the failure itself. The schemes are evil, sure. I don't really want to shoot down a satellite or start a world war myself. But you get invested in the effort. You get caught up in the enthusiasm. I mean, wh whatever it is, cross a goal line, replace the president with an android, it's all just arbitrary goals in a way. And everybody wants to be in the winning team. So by the time the intruders come, we're excited, we're confident of success, you know? It's really just about done, and you think to yourself, well, it's too late now, they can't stop us, the rocket's already been launched, and the intruder is being lowered into the incinerator. Surely this time, this time, we will win one. It's amazing, the human capacity for self-deception, especially mom. When everything blows up, and once again we've shot magazines and magazines into thin air where the intruders used to be. And the rocket explodes, making a beautiful background while the intruder gropes his girlfriend. <laughs> and the roof collapses. Well, generally I just go home. It's not hard in all the chaos, and we're pretty practiced now at finding the escape routes. I get home and Beth just knows, and she says again, and I nod, and I tell her about it, and I will. I really will. But just not then. The kids come and they yell, Daddy, Daddy, what did you do today? And I tell them the usual lies about working in IT. <laughs> and I see them lose interest just a bit in their boring old dad. And I wish I could tell them the truth. But on those days, on, on too many days, I'm too embarrassed. At least in my imaginary IT career, I occasionally win one. The next day after a defeat, we always go back to the secret base, which is sometimes still smoking. Once, after a particularly bad disaster, I think the intruder program, Dr. Apocalypse's escape pod, to go into orbit, it took a month to get back. Anyway, we tried <laughs> to organize ourselves. Maybe we didn't need an all-knowing, evil, genius barking orders, threatening us with instant death for the slightest mistake, giving us really excellent but non-transferable health care benefits. Maybe we can be our own supervillain. Turns out, we can't. 
We spent a few days trying to put out the fires and get the computers up and running again, but after a while we just fell back into our old roles, patrolling the gates and corridors, checking in the empty hostage cages, waiting for someone to come get us and bring us to the new secret base. Recently, though, the dream has started to change. I am not in the corridor. I'm in a tight, constricted space, but big enough for me to move through. I'm crawling. I'm wearing tight clothing, but I'm feeling free. I move toward the light in front of me. There, through a grill in the metal floor, light coming upwards. I look down, and two men in jumpsuits are standing there, holding machine guns. But I don't feel scared. I don't feel like I'm going to walk into something that won't end well. I don't start thinking about the lies I'm going to have to tell my children about what I do to keep them safe and warm and happy. I feel good. I feel really good, really confident. I have a really good feeling about how all of this is going to come out. And that's how I know I'm dreaming. Thank you.